Today, I'm speaking with Anna Danielchuk, who has been creating a war diary since the early days of the full-scale invasion of Ukraine by Russia in 2022. She aims to tell the truth about Ukraine when there are so many attempts to propagandize the war and the causes of the war. Anna is passionate about the beauty and independence of her country and communicates this very powerfully in her videos in a subjective, emotional and honest way. Welcome to Silicon Curtain Podcast. If you enjoy the material we create, then please do like and subscribe to help boost the popularity of our videos in YouTube. Anna, I'm so grateful uh, for you to spend the time to talk to us today. And it is an honor for me to visit your channel and to speak about my country, Ukraine. Fantastic. Well, let's jump straight into the questions. And um, well, we'll start off on a, on a very personal level. You know, what was your life like before the war? How did you fill your time? Well, I worked at the university. I'm a PhD in linguistics and I teach students. Also, I work and con worked and continue working for a non-governmental organization that is collect connected with cultural heritage, popularization and preservation. And also I was a journalist for the daily Ukrainian newspaper of the day. And I believe I felt myself very European. I belong to that generation of Ukrainians who already feel the benefits of the visa-free regime, language skills, and actually we feel very much connected with Europe and with the Western world. And um, I felt like when we started talking about war and there were lots of news everywhere and the reports of the intelligence services it was everywhere. And my country was at war with Russia since 2014 because it all began with the annexation of Crimea, uh, with the war in Donbass. For us, this was war. And uh, but at the same time, with all this news about full scale invasion, full scale war, we did not believe it's possible. Because of what my subscribers explained me is normalcy bias. Like when you live in a normal world, you have normal system of values. Maybe you're good, maybe you're bad, but you are close to this standards of uh, normal living in a globalized world. You cannot predict something like that is possible. In the 21st century, in the heart of Europe, without no particular uh, reason. So I belong to the vast majority of Ukrainians who did not believe it is possible. We thought maybe there will be some provocations or hot actions on the territory of front that already existed in the east of Ukraine, but we did not Im imagine something like that is uh, possible because it goes against any logic. And you know, now I agree with the famous quote that it is not a crime, it is a mistake that Putin uh, committed, and it is, though it's a very pricey mistake, but uh, like I see that my logics and the beliefs of so many Ukrainians and so many Europeans and people all over the world, that it is totally wrong, totally illogical to start the war. Actually, this is true, despite the actions of the Russian military and the Putin's regime. So I was living this normal life. <laughs> I liked my country. I saw many of its problems, but at the same time, many of the beautiful things that we have developed want to change. I was not fascinated with our politicians, but I was very proud of our civil society that is very active. And uh, I did not believe something like that can happen. Mm. I mean, that has fascinating echoes with, um, I mean, I know, you will have studied uh, a lot of a lot of history, and Ukrainian history is getting, uh, you know, far more popular, especially under the the current circumstances. But there's extraordinary echoes in what you say about this normalcy. You know, people trying to live their normal lives, even going out to restaurants the the day before, the evening before, uh, you know, the invasion began. And you read the same accounts of 1917. Um, people saying the same things, ambassadors and so on, saying the same things, business people in St. Petersburg saying, don't worry, you know, there won't be a revolution. Uh, nothing's going to change. It can't happen here. You know, look all around you at uh, the, the trade, the wealth, you know, it makes no sense. So yeah. it's an extraordinary pivotal moment, isn't it, when, when that changes? 
yeah, you are very right in your observations. And uh, Ukrainians actually, before the start of this war, very much compared the period of 1917, 1922 in the history of Ukraine with the modern one. Because this was also a short period when my country was independent uh, after the fall of the Russian Empire. And today you can hear more and more often that we were actually occupied by the Soviet Union. We were not that much among the creators of the Soviet Union, but more among the uh, peoples who were occupied. And when you look at this uh, history and our history from this perspective, then you get the answer to a question that I often receive from uh, my subscribers that for ages, it seemed to us that Ukraine is Russia, that Belarus is Russia, that Moldova is Russia, and there is no great difference because they equate Soviet Union to Russia, and as a result, our nations. And then they are surprised, why the Baltic countries, why Ukraine, why Georgia, countries that were close to the USSR or were part of the USSR, so fiercely fight against the idea of its uh, reconstruction. Because we were occupied by it back then, uh, we were not like dreaming about it. We were not constructing it. We got close to the epicenter of evil in Moscow and we were hidden and occupied for decades. And that, uh, I mean, you've touched on one of um, the first Soviet myths, I think, that we're going to talk about. Um, you know, I'd love to dig a bit more into your personal experience first, but let's let's get one of the biggest Soviet myths out of the way. And that is that uh, Russia was a liberating force after the Second World War. I think that myth has permeated, you know, Western academia really up until the present time. But that's starting to change, isn't it? And for some of the reasons you've just mentioned, um, people are starting to examine Russia's behavior, uh, both, you know, in occupied Berlin, the, the mass rape of hundreds of thousands of women uh, in Berlin in 1945, 1946, but then also that behavior over decades of repression. And, you know, I've got a lot of friends from, from the Baltics, you know, and it's well-known cultural heritage that when Russia took over those countries, they identified the intellectual elite, the cultural elite, uh, and, and and they basically liquidated them. And I think that knowledge has been lost in the West, hasn't it? But as you say, in the Baltics and Ukraine, there's a very strong memory, um, even passed down through families of, of people, you know, disappearing, and especially if they're educated uh, or educators or writers or culturally significant. Yeah, uh, actually, uh, these first decades of the Soviet Union and the last also, they were very tragic for Ukrainians and other uh, nations that were occupied by the USSR. And uh, sometimes I try to imagine how different my country would be if we managed to continue living our own life, uh, developing our own way. And when I read the literature from the 20s, for example, I'm surprised how rich was the language, how modern and global were the ideas, because lots of these writers, they were able to travel, they were able to exchange their experience. They spent some time, for example, in London or in Paris. They did not know the borders will be closed for ages for us. And uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, Ukraine was very much a part of, uh, once again, Europe. And uh, later this door closed. The Second World War is one of the biggest tragedies of our main mankind. And uh, it is awful how Russians managed to uh, pervert uh, the idea of the victory. Uh, so the Second World War is a very tragic experience for all of the world. That's why it is actually called the World War. And uh, for me, it's a mystery how Russians managed to uh, create this myth that they are the only winners in this war. And this is really bad because now in Ukraine, we understand that we are very brave, we are very strong, but at the same time, we are very much dependent and grateful to our allies. Because everything that we receive, weapons, trainings, and even understanding, the return of the diplomats during the wartime, all of this is very important. A symbolic gesture of the Ukrainian candidacy to the EU. Uh, even if it does not go smoothly, quickly, and so on, there are lots of things that are vital and they happen outside Ukraine. So any victory, it's a cooperation. And uh, knowing that 
uh, land lease started during the Second World War. Britain was the country who actually uh, like stopped this uh, ease in Hitler's uh, plan and so on and turned away and started like very often Ukrainians. I'm very grateful when the British compare Ukrainians to them during the Second World War. Like, like we have to stand, uh, we have to protect every piece of our land standing against this evil. And uh, this is weird how they describe it only as their victory. It goes without saying that Russians, Ukrainians, Poles, Belarusians did a lot. But at the same time, not everything. Then uh, for in many post-Soviet countries, and I don't like this term, but in many post-Soviet countries, there are memorials to the Second World War. And in Russia, it is still they, that way that uh, they describe the dates of the World War as 1941-1945. In Ukraine, we have changed that to 1939 because, for example, the Western Ukraine became a part of the USSR only in 1939. So even for us, it started in 1939. And this vividly describes that Russians don't care about the world. Uh, they did not care about it when they signed Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact that is not discussed in Russian schools. And um, also, I have written an article about that. I know that after the end of the Second World War, Churchill had an idea to continue because he felt like uh, a part of the world, Eastern Europe, is under great threat of the iron curtain falling and many victims of another totalitarian regime. And it is totally true. It is once again that I think how different our countries would mm -hmm. be if we uh, did not become a part mm -hmm. of this Eastern peg of the USSR and so on. You know, that uh, starting the, from the beginning of the 20th century, the population of Ukraine lost 16 million people and it goes against the rules of demography i know fallen demography all of that but not that quickly we had holodomor we had deportations we had red terror uh many of our intellectuals writers composers disappeared in those camps like gulag and the best people forming the national cultural identity were lost and this is a very big tragedy and the fact that they manipulate now that we are the winners of uh, the Nazi regime, we won the war and they try to look for the pains of consciousness, for example, in Germany and elsewhere. This is a very big sin, I think. And um, one of the slogans that appeared uh, during Putin's regime, it seems to me, when they started turning victory celebration into Pobedobesie, what is called like, I don't know, going crazy about victory, is we can repeat. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think that people who have experience of war, people who went through the war, will never say a phrase like, we can repeat. And this is it. I think this this really contrasts uh, the Western attitude to the to the Second World War. And the phrase never again really does mean something. It means you know, we, we don't want to repeat that, even though almost nobody who went through the war experiences is, is now alive. Um, we do have the memories of, uh, of of our grandparents. We have their stories and recollections uh, that we can recall. And the other the other bit to pick up on your point about Russian isolationism it is such a perversion of the reality, isn't it? Because Lend-Lease isn't something that was just implemented to support Britain and help it survive. Um, you know, the Nazi blockade, the sea blockades uh, and the U-boats. Lend-Lease also applied to Russia. And in fact, the yes, vast... Soviet Union. Yes, yeah. I mean, they the, were the, e geez. using the cars. They were yeah. eating the food. Yeah. Uh, and there and were lots the... of... Uh, uh, high precision Photos. parts, ball bearings, uh, you know, advanced technology was used as components in, you know, in tanks and other materials that were essential. Yeah. Yeah, they were essential. And it's pretty obvious that without the support of land lease, we don't know how would this war uh, end. It mm. was a very important uh, change. Like right now we feel the same. Like, okay, we are brave, we don't want to, we don't want our country to be destroyed, but there are things that we need. 
and just the same uh, so, so about the Soviet Union. Soviet Union was always a poor country, despite the image it created. And uh, it did not have enough uh, uh, of the technology of the provision for its soldiers. And there are lots of photos, there are lots of video footages that demonstrate Soviet soldiers using uh, the support of the allies. And it seems to me once again that back in the 50s, people knew about that, people understood that. They did not have these big parades. They did not uh, like uh, demonstrate that the victory is only of the Soviet Union. In the 50s, in the 60s, it was more or less uh, closer to reality. But now Russian propaganda uses it and uh, they somehow want to make the rest of the world, including those who were fighting together with them, feel the rest of the world guilty. I don't know, like, once again, why? Like, because we are close. I mean, right up until the 2000s, um, you know, Western ambassadors, even leaders would would attend uh, some of those Victory Day parades. They would come as as guests and there wasn't that sort of antagonism. And I think yet it's only somebody who hasn't gone through it or hasn't had that uh, direct connection to Second World War could actually use it uh, for such you know, put the, put a word on it, you know, evil, evil purposes, manipulative purposes. If you look at Khrushchev and others, that generation that managed to avert uh, you know, nuclear catastrophe during the um, Cuban Missile Crisis, one mm -hmm. one of the reasons that was averted is because they they still had that connection to the war, to the tragedy and the horror of that. And of course, Khrushchev had a direct experience of the Holodomor. So even though he was clearly, you know, Soviet as opposed to Ukrainian. He did have, you know, direct recollection of of the pure horrors that that system could inflict at its worst, and I don't think he wanted a a repeat of that. Yeah, and the, like the cult of Stalin was still remembered, and the attitude towards him were changing. So there are periods that are described sometimes as warmer uh, in the Soviet Union, but still there will be spheres where Khrushchev was really bad, for example, like education it was totally russified during his period. But, mm -hmm. but... And how, how do you think um, Ukrainians through this Soviet period, which lasted for decades, I was amazed at how long it actually survived for a system that seems to me so, you know, irrational in many ways um but it lasted for decades and it had a profound change on culture on people's personalities and behaviors and yet as you say ex-soviet states uh, as they emerged into uh and tried to rediscover their identities from the baltics to eastern europe to ukraine they have diverged relatively quickly haven't they and why do you think is it that ukraine has you know, I know that process isn't finished yet, but how did Ukraine retain a connection to its identity as an independent country in the 20s? And how did it reestablish that connection to, say, the 19th century, when it was also struggling uh, under the sort of imperial pressure to uh, you know, abandon its language and national identity? Well, you've used this word, struggling. Mm -hmm. And... Uh... You are right. It seems to me like I cannot find this answer. But when you look at like 300 years of our history, for example, back, uh, you will see we had constant problems with Russia, Russian Empire, Soviet Union, now Russian Federation. And at the same time, there is something built in our DNA or in the Ukrainian spirit, I don't know, that we continue uh, struggling. We had periods, short periods of independence. That's why I don't like saying like, we are a young country. No, we are a very old country. We are, uh, our history dates back to Kiev Rus. We were like <laughs> the center of uh, the civilization that Russia abandoned and uh, totally changed its direction to a different perspective. And then we had the Cossack state that was very freedom loving. And then we had this spell of independence at the beginning of the 20th century. And all of that gave birth to generations of talented people, writers, poets, uh, scientists, politicians. And uh, this constant struggle that continued part of, for example, Western Ukraine joined the USSR in 1939. And there were lots of rebellions against the USSR up to the 60s. And... Uh, 
there were a uh, lots of territories that are a little bit maybe agricultural were less industrialized and people were able to live their life more or less peacefully we were on the borders with poland for example that is also under the influence of communism but not to that extent and i think that it is in the ukrainian spirit we have never fully accepted uh that we are a part of the russian empire and uh, we gave birth, actually, to Moscow and to the Russian Empire. And this is what they, the, stealing our identity, they tried to substitute the facts and then they fail. Uh, I'm not saying that, like, being older or being the mother of the Rus cities or so on means that much. No, you can be a modern state, a new state, and still successful. But they want to steal everything, and they forget that by stealing facts, they cannot steal the spirit that made us this way, that made our country prosperous, that created, for example, Cossacks or one of the first constitutions in the world, uh, that we are different. And now when you look at the societies of Ukraine and Russia, you will see what? When we don't like our politicians and it's normal, we never worship them, we never let our presidents to serve for 22 years, we start protesting. And we always protest peacefully. Uh, you saw how beautiful was Orange Revolution. And Maidan Revolution was tragic only because of the uh, pro-Russian Yanukovych uh, actions. But in general, we always demonstrate that we don't like something. We understand that uh, politicians are our servants or our like um, they, they work together with us they are not gods they are not tsars and in russia like they have perfect conditions now to protest all the military <laughs> are in ukraine uh they don't like this mobilization they don't live well you can see the streets of their uh, small towns how they look and still they never protest they say like i'm a political let me suffer my life and uh, perhaps this is uh, something different in their history and their mm. national character. This is something I cannot explain. Ukrainians cannot accept. You know, there were photos after this drone attacks uh, in the in Kiev of Ukrainian civilians opening the windows and trying to shoot the drones. Because like shooting the drone, you can uh, actually, because some people say, no, it's not wise. No, it is advised to do so because you can stop it from um, targeting a serious infrastructure. Of course, it's dangerous to shoot in the streets, but when you have war and you can stop a, a drone, you have to try and do it. I cannot imagine Russians doing something similar. Mm -hmm. Because it's top down, isn't it? I've heard it said that it, the, 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 at the simplest, most simplistic level, it's comparing the horizontal behavior to a vertical and the russian is a top-down system and people as you say lower down the chain wouldn't dream of taking any initiative for fear yeah. that they would be punished for doing so whereas it seems yeah. ukrainians are a little more chaotic a little more independent minded that they'd say yeah. okay well you know i'm not gonna rely on the government to do this i'm gonna go ahead and do that myself yeah, that's what we always do. When we don't like something on the streets, we start repairing them or in the schools or in the hospitals. When the state does not have money or initiative, people do that. Mm -hmm. Because like, um, I don't know. Uh, I'm not saying that we are perfect. There is a joke, like when you have two Ukrainians, you will have three hetmans. Like, <laughs> but uh uh, this also tells a lot, like, we don't worship leaders, we do see they are imperfect, and they need our help, and democracy is like r rule of people, and that's what people do from time to time in Ukraine, and it was never experienced in uh, Russia, as mm. I see. And if they break the so-called social contract, um, like Yanukovych, which, when, when he reneged on, you know, his um, agreement, to to get closer to the EU. I mean, that's seen as a break, isn't it, between the leadership and the people, and it's yeah. seen as valid at that point to protest that 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 is the expression of democracy, not keeping you know somebody in power that doesn't represent that will of the people. I think that's yeah. 
Yeah. Plus, nobody like intended uh, to kill him or something. It was a normal, healthy protest. When I visit lots of European capitals, I always see protests. This is uh, like um, I cannot say a landmark of Europe. People protest against something. That's the way they demonstrate they don't like something, and then normal government what it does reacts. And uh, Yanukovych did not want to react because he got his manual how to behave from Russia. Mm -hmm. And in Russia, like the people do not, they protest a lot. And, uh, you know, very often they use this illustration that in Russia you get arrested very quickly, put in autozak and you s go to prison. Mm -hmm. And then they have a counter argument. When you look at Ukrainian pro protests, for example, and Ma at Maidan, you will see that people were also put in autozaks, but the rest of people around did not watch, observe, or film it on mobile phones. They started shaking these autozaks, and uh, at the end, people won because there were a million of people and a thousand of policemen. This is something I'm really trying to sort of understand because, you know, I, I, I've seen this behavior directly myself, uh, not in the context of war, but in the context of sort of, uh, you know, protests and so on. I've seen people get arrested uh, in, in Russia. That was before Bolotna in, in 2012. So protests were a little bit more vigorous uh, that in that period. And in the 90s, they could be a little more vocal. But um, but I think there's there's an interesting difference that I'm, I'm struggling to understand because often you know, you'll, you'll, you, it's very easy to fall into sort of stereotypes or generalizations, which can be offensive. But there's a key difference, isn't there, in behavior? If you see Ukraine and even in Iran now as well, people, I think, feel that, that, that somehow the country belongs to them. That for good or ill, you know, whether it's got a, a you know, a good regime or a bad one, if there's things to fix, they still feel that it's their country and they have some kind of ownership. Therefore, protest is the right thing to do you have a right to do that you have some role in the society whereas i know it's difficult to blame individual russians who who are fleeing tyranny and are going to georgia mongolia and and so on but to me the fact that they are saving themselves their families as individuals is understandable but it suggests to me that they don't have any sense of ownership of their country no responsibility yes. for the future of their country very true. Uh, when I like for a Ukrainian, it's pretty difficult to be neutral to Russians. Like mm. I try not to spread hatred on my channel and um, don't be like, don't go deep into that. And when I choose this neutral mode, the only thing I can tell you, I think that Russian society is very deeply traumatized. Yeah. They are much more traumatized that you, than Ukrainians with all the Holodomors, deportations and wars. Mm. And this trauma that they don't even notice uh, creates people that are not citizens, they are just population. And this observation of uh, normal Russians fleeing, uh, flee, uh, leaving Russia for Georgia and elsewhere is an example that like these are almost the best people, many influencers and so on, and they don't want to influence. They don't want to change anything inside their society. They give up. In Ukraine, yes, there were lots of refugees who are now in the EU and uh, elsewhere, and that's understandable. Like, why? But at the same time, the majority of Ukrainians stayed in dangerous zones and continue shooting drones, volunteering, doing everything when it is a threat to your life. In Russia, they escape when there is no like direct, like they don't have missiles falling on their heads. And in Ukraine, we do have, and at the same time, we are more proud about our country. We are more confident and maybe even more happy than they are. And so it's interesting is... to compare, yeah, I mean, Belarusians as well. It's interesting to compare as well. I know those protests um, were eventually controlled and suppressed, but for a period, it seemed to me that there was a lot of similarity between Belarus and Ukraine. You know, Belarusians did come out in force. Um, they did protests from their windows obviously under a extreme sort of duress eventually you know those were suppressed and of course russia imported its propaganda machine to to sow division and depression um but again i think you know belarusians seem to sit halfway between russia and and uh, and ukraine and there's 
there's a potential at least that they could perhaps uh, topple their regime and have a chance perhaps of an independent future. But it's interesting, the Belarusian language was eradicated, you know, far more successfully, wasn't it, than the Ukrainian language. In some ways, Belarus has less connection to the entity before, uh, you know, um, they were fully absorbed in the Soviet Union. And a lot more of that has been kind of eradicated. Do you think that will make it a lot more difficult for Belarus to to become an independent entity? And, and more of these Soviet myths are kind of entrenched there than in Ukraine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right. Uh, well, like from one point of view, I feel more optimistic about Belarus because they protest, they try to change the president, they somehow demonstrate their dissatisfaction. Mm. But the linguistic situation is tragic. You won't find like you will find two five percent of people who still speak Belarus. Maybe that will change, but uh, most of their history discourse is once again rotates again around the Second World War partisan movement. They forgot about their connections with, for example, the Grand Duchy of Lithuania or Ukraine or elsewhere when they were active um, actors in uh, the European life. And uh, like I really believed during that summer protest in 2020, it seems to me that something good can come out and still uh, the so-called president dictator Lukashenko managed to suppress this movement. At the same time, I feel like that even more or less passive population of Belarus is more against war than Russians. So mm -hmm. I think, and more sabotage. I mean, it's very difficult to know yeah, the truth. But it I seems think there, more... there are lots of Belarus fighting for Ukraine, and I think they are not that much fighting for Ukraine. They also collect important uh, experience for their own country, and they can apply it in future. So I'm more optimistic about Belarus. And, um, you know, I even have comments from Russians telling me that by winning over Putin, you will liberate Russia. <laughs> Sounds <laughs> weird, like we will have to liberate yeah. Russia. But, um, but uh, our experience and if we lead, like our victory must lead to the fall mm. of the Putin's regime then uh, it will definitely lead to the fall of the Lukashenko's regime because he's totally dependent on uh, Putin and that might be a good chance for Belarus. It seems to me that Russians depending on uh, Ukraine to help liberate them is both delusional and unfair in, in many ways. And I've heard some Ukrainians really express an extreme dislike from that point of view because essentially Russians need to take responsibility for, for the changes yeah. in their own society. And you're right. And if we were shaking the system from both sides, we're protecting ourselves and like uh, stopping their soldiers and they protesting inside Russia, that would definitely help this war to end sooner. But they simply observe mm. because they are well, afraid and they try explaining like, oh, it's so dangerous to protest because you will get to a prison. But it's so dangerous to live in Ukraine because uh, thousands are killed a month. How can I understand, how can I sympathize them mm. uh, being a Ukrainian? I mean, it's also not rational as well, because uh, I would I would guess that the odds of survival are far greater uh, going to prison in Russia now than uh, than they actually are being sent to the front. I mean, the 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 period of being grabbed off the street in Moscow or wherever and then, you know, actually ending up in a in a body bag. Uh, is apparently 10 days. You know, the first yeah. conscripts are now returning back. So it, it defies any kind of rationality. Um, but that's, you know, that that's part of the territory with, with Russia, isn't it? Um, what I really wanted to understand as well, because you mentioned something about your audience and the comments, and that's fascinating. Do you get a sense of who your audience is? Uh, um, because your videos have got hundreds of thousands of, of views um, over, you know, the last uh, seven months. Do you get a sense of your audience's perspective and who they are from the comments they make? Yeah, I very much value my audience. It is 100% natural. I have never planned to be a vlogger and never set it as my goal. It was more like a therapeutic effect or a try to tell like more subjective, more emotional, more uh, humane things about Ukraine, not just statistics. And uh, the people, I, I recognize many of the commentators, and they come from different corners of the world. 
And of course, many of them come from the United States, from the UK, our greatest supporters, and I feel that a lot, many come from the northern countries, Finland, that experienced war with Russia, the Baltic countries, Poland. I also have subscribers from Taiwan who uh, observe the situation here very attentively and Hong Kong, because many uh, of their destiny is also decided here in Ukraine and all over the world. Uh, so, um, of course, I can feel different attitudes, different focuses that they have on the situation, but it all helps me uh, feel how the world reacts. And uh, But in general, I am like super grateful for all of these people because they provide advice. They contact their local politicians, uh, like trying to influence if they become, I don't know, to uh, passive towards the situation of Ukraine. They support Ukrainian refugees. They get interested in Ukrainian culture and history, and that all helps us fight. That is very important. And of course, this war, you know, it would be better if it hadn't happened, of course, but Ukrainians do seem to be extremely resilient. How do you think this war has changed the lives of every single Ukrainian? I mean, both those that have remained and those that are abroad, abroad we're talking about some really, you know, long-term changes. Some, of course, are going to be traumatic. There's going to be terrible psychological damage. On the other hand, yeah, there may be some sort of positives, as strange as it, you know, it seems, out of the experience. Well, of course, I understand there will be lots of trauma, psychological and physiological, but I don't want to speak about that. And sometimes I try to calm myself down when I imagine, when I recollect uh, Europe after the Second World War. And it seems to me that was a very golden period. And many people were like very strong and optimistic, maybe uh, having gone through so many troubles. Somehow they went out of this experience, not as victims, but as winners. And um, that's why I want to believe that uh, my people and my country will be stronger and uh, like will develop faster. And um, f what I obviously see is that Putin with his war in Ukraine achieved just the contrary to what he wanted. He wanted to de Nazify Ukraine, of course, we never had Nazis here. And for Putin, everyone who was a part of the Soviet Union and considers himself not a Russian is a Nazi. If you don't speak Russian, then you are a Nazi and so on. Okay. We're, we're but, Nazis now, uh, if you read Lavrov's latest comments. They are everywhere. Yeah, we've all become and Nazis. Is, uh, very, <laughs> there are lots of Nazis. And um, uh, so he wanted to denationalize, to erase national identity, and he did just the contrary. Many people who were in Russian neutral, who spoke Russian, now desperately want to switch to Ukrainian, desperately want to dig deeper into their family history, to find some Ukrainian traditions. So uh, he managed to unite all of us. We are extremely united. I can tell you perhaps the nation, the East, the West, the South, the North, is more united than ever in the last century. So he managed to create this very strong modern Ukrainian nation. He wanted to demilitarize us and did just the country with the support of our allies, with various trainings and this real fighting battlefield experience, we are becoming really strong. And once again, there is a joke that I like to repeat. Before the start of this war, people believed that Russian army is the second army in the world. And now they know that Russian army is the second army in Ukraine. <laughs> so our experience uh, that we get uh, will definitely be useful for NATO and for other countries, because like this is an experience we would like to never have. But now, after learning so much about weapons, tactics, and so on, we have become very strong militarily. And perhaps with a neighbor like Russia, we'll have to stay in this. So I believe, and I want to believe that our nation will be united, will be strong, and also uh, very much uh, connected with the rest of the world. That's what I have understood. I have understood that we must be attentive to all the wars and conflicts all around the world because everything is global. Mm. And uh, the support is very important. And um, I hope that soon um, 
the interest to my country will stay, but it will be focused on some of our historical facts. And now there are lots of things that Ukraine can show to the world. And I hope the day when it is safe will come soon. And uh, continuing that thought, I mean, I, I quite like the joke as well that actually NATO needs to apply to join uh, Ukraine and not the other <laughs> yeah. way around. I like it too. <laughs> but uh, we are very grateful to NATO and especially NATO countries who provide us with the things we need and with the uh, knowledge skills that we need. And obviously Ukraine is changing. Ukrainians are changing. The West perhaps changes a little slower, but do you think journalism and academia now need to change radically in the West? Because historically, really, from most of the 20th century, uh, there has been a Moscow-centric perspective. So academics who are even studying Ukraine would come to it via, you know, Russian studies. Uh, journalists yeah. who are reporting on Ukraine would typically be based in Moscow and so on. This has to change now, doesn't it? Yeah. And this has to change. And this is a very beautiful discovery that awaits Western, for example, journalists. Because I'm not talking only about Ukraine. There are many beautiful, let's say, East European states, Central European states that are unknown and that to the world. They are, to some extent, they are incognita. But uh, when people will stop looking at them as a part of Russia, or as a gloomy post-Soviet Republic or something, they will discover lots of interesting historical connections, lots of interesting uh, perspectives, uh, tasty food, I don't know, beautiful locations. And I think that this process has already started. And of course, Moscow, Russia is the biggest country in the world. The question, why do they need more lands? <laughs> Being a biggest country in the world with lots of money and resources, they were also financing and investing into their image outside Russia. That's why we don't have to blame all of the people who looked at Ukraine, at Moldova, at Georgia through the glasses made and prepared by Russia. But now, having seen the true face of Russian chauvinism, and it's not only Putin, like it would be very good if it was only Putin, but come on, Putin is a product of his society. Mm. Putin uh, could not be nurtured in Ukraine. This is it. I mean, this yeah. is one of the most persistent myths. And um, this is a classic Russian disinformation, uh, which is that somehow NATO and the West created Putin. I mean, Putin was made in Russia. Putin was made in the KGB. Uh, and he's very much a product of, of that Soviet uh, system. And not just the Soviet system, because, of course, you had the Communist Party and you had the Siloviki which were two power centers uh, in the Soviet Union. Now, of course, you only really have one power center, which is the Siloviki, which Putin represents. And uh, in, no, in no way is he a product of our system because, um, you know, I see him as a figure that is entirely morally bankrupt. You know, there are no barriers there in terms of what he won't do. And there's no value yeah. placed on the individual in any sense. Yeah. And you know, like no value in individual, this is like an old Russian tradition. I have remember, I remember reading some memoirs of one of the French generals during Napoleon Wars and mm. his claim that actually we planned to win and we had everything to win, but we did not realize that Russians do not value lives of their soldiers at all. And they have many of them, you know. They don't value them at all. And they start doing things that seem illogical and abnormal to any other uh, military person, for example. And even during the Second World War, there were so many victims among Soviet soldiers. Uh, like, I think millions could have survived if they were not in a hurry, if they cared about people. With the same result, they never care about individuals. And this is like uh, one of the traditional Russian problems that is crystallized in Putin today. And yes, definitely. I remember like thinking when we read legends or watch films, sometimes this borderline between good and bad, black and white is very vivid. And you think, oh, it cannot be like that in the real life. But then you see Putin and you realize, yeah, a person can be 100% evil. And all what he does is just like pure evil. With Absolutely. This yeah. What he does for Ukraine and what he does for his own society. Because I believe 
he will destroy Russia, not Ukraine with his actions. Absolutely. You know, his uh, his behavior is corrosive uh, and, and utterly divisive to Russians themselves. I suspect many don't yet realize it. Uh, it, it takes a while for that realization to really come through. Um, I've only got some two more questions, really, I think, because I know we're, we're running short on time. The first one was you've covered a lot of Soviet mythology uh, and, you know, the corrosive impact that has had. Which would you say is still the most important of those Soviet myths, the lingering ones that Ukraine still needs to, to kill off finally? Uh, for Ukraine or for the world? Well, both maybe, yeah, if you have an idea for, for both. Well, I think that uh, one of the greatest myths that we are fighting and now we are actually winning was this idea of Soviet people. It was actually one of the first myths that we decided to debunk because for generations of Western Europeans, I don't know, Americans, all of our countries were alike. Lithuania, Ukraine, uh, Poland, uh, like being the party of USSR, being close to the zone of influence of the USSR. And uh, many people were surprised, like when we protested against uh, Russia's actions, why are you doing so? It's your part of the world, it's your country. And <clears throat> even at the start of this war, many serious global politicians had this attitude. They believed Ukraine won't be able to withstand Putin's blitzkrieg and they were ready to sell the country to uh, Russia. And perhaps deep down inside of their heads, they believed they are not doing something really bad, but they still be return a part of Russia to Russia. So one of the most important myths that we are fighting, we are showing our identities. Believe me, Ukrainians and Russians are so different. Like I, like, I don't know what other nations are so different. And you can see it during this war very vividly. So I hope the world will understand that. And also maybe there were lots of people who had sentiments for the Soviet Union in Ukraine and in other countries, people who spend their youth and they somehow substitute the happiness of youth with the happiness of Soviet Union. You know, perhaps there were lots of people in Germany who were happy during Nazi regime, but not because of the Nazi regime, but because they were dating their boyfriend or mm. eating something tasty. So, and Soviet Union tries to recreate this. Oh, Soviet Union was a happy period. And now those who were treating Russia as a brother state, they realized they made a huge mistake and they realized it not because of Ukrainian propaganda, but because of Russian missiles coming to Kharkiv, for example. It's very vivid. And, and those missiles tell them exactly that actually Russia doesn't care about them. You know, Russia has, yeah. you know, doesn't have their best interests at heart. And, yeah, and really... And to tell you the truth, I even want to speak about that later too in my vlogs that uh, destroying Ukrainian infrastructure like electric power stations, uh, they already demonstrate they understand they will not win those territories. Because if they had plans to develop, to they would never do it. They simply want to spoil our life, then to spoil other countries' life, then to spoil the world's life. That's what is their mission, to export hatred, poverty, I don't know, corruption, and they are doing it pretty mm. well. <laughs> and there's a, there's a powerful word for that, I think, in, in Russian, which is zavist, and it's always, I've always thought that that is maybe the word that, that explains most about Russia yeah. behavior, uh, unfortunately. It means jealousy or envy. During these years of independence, <clears throat> many Ukrainians worked uh, in the EU. And I don't treat it as a negative fact. It's like always natural moving to the West, uh, earning money and so on. But many of them return back having earned some money that on the jobs that are better paid in the EU, for example. And they try to bring like some of the positive things they've learned uh, from uh, Europe in the construction of their houses, for example, or in the attitude to the environment. So we take this like copy paste and we are never angry at people who live better than we are. We want to learn from them. We want to copy that style, but I don't think it's a crime. We want to introduce this standards and things in Ukraine, but we never want to destroy your houses, your uh, schools or something. And Russians do the opposite. Uh, they have so much work to do inside 
their country, but they don't do it. And then they come to Ukraine, they are surprised that we have better roads, that we have better apartments, that we have better wardrobes that they later loot. This is a tragedy when a soldier of uh, an enemy army comes and steals your sneakers. This is a tragedy of that country, not of Ukraine. Because we're not a rich country, you know it, you will come, you will see, but uh, we are trying to work it out. We're trying to learn from others and we don't hate others for the fact that they live better. We'll learn from them. Oh, that's there are some things you can learn from us. So we feel... We don't feel like humiliated. We do, it's it's a normal process. We were a part of the Soviet Union. We have problems with private property. We had so many problems and now we are recovering. And while recovering, we learn. We borrow techniques and standards that were already developed. And Russians know they want to come destroy and let you live uh, as bad as they are. And then they are relaxed. Like if you suffer the way they are, everything is fine. <laughs> Instead of learning from others. <laughs> And this enemy that they are always looking for, does it exist? No. And, uh, you know, that, that speaks to their own fragility, fragility as a society, fragility as a political system, that they have to sort of, you know, constantly um, project this aggression uh, in order to preserve what, in essence, is a, is a fragile system. Is an empire that survived you know a century after other empires have collapsed into into history and something you said i think is really kind of interesting there about learning from europe because one of the reasons to set this channel up is that i got the impression that there is a lot that we can learn from ukraine from how ukraine has become resilient since 2014 and has been developing you know social infrastructure self-organization and especially the techniques to counter propaganda and disinformation. I think there's huge lessons for us to learn there in the West um, because we're also vulnerable to many of the things that, uh, that that you've been subjected to. Yeah, because you live in a normal world and you don't expect something that abnormal to happen. Absolutely. And now you see it can. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we I, my last closer, point here. Yeah, we were closer to this epicenter of evil. You know, very often, like, there are lots of problems in Ukraine. I do not deny we have these problems, but many of them were honestly imported from Russia, from Soviet Union. And, uh, like, we are fighting them. We are showing them, like, talking to a doctor. <laughs> and this is a healthy process. And, of course, we know Russia better. And uh, taking into account it has become a global threat, we can be useful here in explaining the way they think and the way they don't think. <laughs> and my last question was, uh, I realised that I haven't phrased my last question properly because I was going to ask, you know, how will you adapt to normal life after the war? But I realised there will be no normal, will there? Ukraine is going to be on the front line now of the democratic world. Um, that iron curtain that fell, um, to an extent, there is going to be that curtain, but it's going to be between Russia and Ukraine now. Um, what what does that new normal look like for you? Is that something actually you think you know could be could be a positive? Well, this war is not yet won, mm. and I cannot imagine what will happen. But I believe we will win. I actually think that we and our allies have already won on the very first day or on, on the second or third day of this war when Putin's creek failed. The world saw his real face. And even if some politicians were ready like to close their eyes, uh, the citizens of this country did not. And the process of our support started. And by the way, we are very grateful to Britain that was the strongest voice and one of the first, like when many were still in doubt. And we know and we will remember that forever. And... Uh, at the same time, so they have already lost. What we are doing, we continue fighting uh, and we are losing people. This is a tragedy. But at the same time, we are already the winners in this war. I don't know how will it finish for Russia. Uh, will it be uh, like the fall of the Putin's regime or he will manage to survive? Or maybe if it's the fall of the Putin's regime, maybe Russia will collapse because there are lots of indigenous peoples that suffer inside Russia. They were severely russified. And for example, in Siberia, there are lots of people who believe they are uh, a different nationality. And it 
will not be a geopolitical catastrophe. It may be that Russia, on the territory of Russia, there will be lots of beautiful independent states with which it will be easier to negotiate gas prices, for example. And uh, people will be able to return to their cultural identities, to revive their national dances, languages. Why not? And Moscow will stay like Moscow and that truly Russian cities. That is not a huge territory. We have Tatarstan, we have Yakutia. They are very different. Come on, they are not Russian. Chechnya is not Russia. And uh, why not? So that would be a very good uh, scenario. I know that people in the world, super politicians are afraid of that because this is a huge change. But at the same time, with this change, we don't need an iron curtain. One country, we need cooperation, exchange, reconciliation, discussions, I don't know, uh, therapy. If Russia stays the way it is, then we have to continue being very strong, militarized. I don't like it. I'm not a military person at all, but then we have to stay strong and we have to teach others how to fight and how to better prevent situations like that because i believe that with a stronger reaction to the annexation of crimea in 2014 we could have prevent this war maybe but putin for a very long period of time saw that people close the eyes on what he does and as a criminal as a person without any moral uh, values he continued like doing it like bullying uh, can i do that oh yeah and i can do that and that and that led to a full-scale war. He believed he will finish it in three days and people won't have enough time to blame him and to see the crimes, but he failed. And now I think he doesn't know what to do. And as an angry beast, he becomes dangerous. That's where we start talking about nuclear weapons and so on, but maybe the world and people around him will prevent that. And hopefully these voices will prevail because I think there's a lot of similarity between the appeasement of the 1930s and and Hitler taking more and more risks because he was able to, and I think there are there are strong parallels there. So hopefully the voices in in the West will remain strong to resist it yeah. and not go down the appeasement route. And you know, I it, so. yeah, I think so too. And it, but it puts such a burden on on Ukraine that's fighting fighting alone. But uh... freedom is not for free. Uh, the color, the the end of the USSR was actually not the fight for Ukrainian independence. It was the collapse of the USSR, and now we fight for the independence. And I wish you every success in that fight. Um, you're doing an incredible job with your videos and with helping to educate people. Um, Slava Ukraini. Hello, I'm Slava. Thank you so much for what you are doing and thank you for the support of your people. We value that very much and these are the things we will never forget. And this means very much to us and good must win.